from my house, and I was given an opportunity to um, begin preaching at this church. They're a King James Bible church, um, great saints, and we've been there for about a year. The church was formerly known as um, the Kane County Baptist Church. We are no longer the Kane County Baptist Church. We're now the Fox River Bible Church. So there's been um, a lot of success and um, things going on in that area. So we want to just acknowledge that. So some of you might have heard that Matt Walker's preaching at a Baptist church. Matt Walker's not preaching at a Baptist church. Matt Walker's preaching at a Grace Church in the Elgin area, a mid-Axe Grace Church. So if you live in um, the western suburbs of Chicagoland, there is a Grace Church um, in your neck of the woods, and the name of the church is the Fox River Bible Church. Um, Charlie and Rochelle have also been extremely instrumental in the, the fruit that we've gotten in that church in the last year. So again, I want to um, publicly thank them and just the saints and just really um, just the ministry and the Word of God is what's doing it, and it's the verses. And, and they, they're, you know, they're studying the same book. So really that's, that's really um, what, the, what the thing has, all been, has been all about. So again, we're, we're very um, thankful in that area, and that's um, our little 20-second commercial. <laughs> so if you, if, you, if you are in the area, there's, I'm going to say real quickly, there's three ways um, that you can be involved or help us out. Um, the first one is just visit. You don't have to necessarily come to the church. You don't have to become a member of the church. Um, show your face at some point. Just, just come by and, and say hi. Um, and then, as with any other church, obviously, there's financial needs and then um, prayer. So th there's some great ways um, that you can help out in that area. So that being said, let's get into the message. Lord God, we thank you for the morning. Um, we thank you for this ministry, which is the Great School of the Bible, and all the, all the work that you've done in and through this ministry and the preaching that's really gone on from coast to coast and beyond um, and, and all the fruit that's happened through the Grace School of the Bible. And um, we just pray for all the men that are involved in the ministry. And um, it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. So as Richard had just mentioned, our message this morning is on reconciliation. Reconciliation. So let's start off in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're talking about reconciliation. Colossians chapter 1. This is a small podium. Yeah. Colossians chapter 1 will begin in verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. So I had just asked somebody um, in our congregation recently, we were talking about that issue, and I said, if I, if I told you that I had just reconciled with my brother, or this person just reconciled with that person. What would I mean by that? And what he said, which I thought was a, a pretty good way of saying it, he said, that means that you buried the hatchet. And I thought, I like that. That's, that's good, that you buried, you buried the hatchet. And, you know, the more I started thinking about that, it was a really good illustration because the idea of a hatchet is something that you use for wrath, <laughs> something that you use to hurt somebody with. And when you bury that thing... What you do is you, you put it away, and you get rid of it, and you, and you, and you cover it up because you, you don't have any need for the, the wrath anymore. And that's really what it is, is burying the hatchet. And um, so really, again, I thought that that was a good illustration. So there's a couple different meanings of that word reconciliation. We want to kind of understand what they are. Um, the first one is really to restore to friendship or harmony. So it's not that you're taking two things and putting them together that have never been together before. It's that, you're, it's that they were together. Something happened. They got, they got split. So it might have been a stick that got broken in half and it's got to get put back together. Maybe there was a wall 
that got put up between the two things. The walls got to get come down, that kind of thing, and then they get back together. They reconcile, and there's there's a state of harmony. Now, another another definition of that is this idea of balance. So to bring into agreement or harmony to make compatible or consistent. So somebody might say to an accountant, have you reconciled the books? The idea, have you, have you, have you put the things in check? Have you, have you put the things in balance? Now, the, the key word that we want to really connect with this word reconciliation is this idea of peace. The end result of the reconciliation is peace. That's what it's about. So something had happened, and now the, now the thing is back to a status of peace. So there's really a couple of the key points that I want to talk about here this morning is that God has several things that he needs to reconcile, and Scripture talks about some different things that need to be reconciled, and we're going to talk about what, what some of those things are. The cross is the key that makes the reconciliation possible. So the cross is, the, the cross is what, what allows the reconciliation to happen. And then one more time, the end result of the reconciliation is peace. So that's the, that's, the, that's the end result of the thing. So as I mentioned, there are several things that need to be reconciled in Scripture. And so we're going to go over these fairly quickly. The first one is, we'll start big, go big or go home. The universe. The universe needs to be reconciled. That's more of a really that putting things back in check, in, in balance, almost like an accountant. They, th things need to be straightened back out. The universe needs to be reconciled. There's a specific part of the creation, when you zoom in a little bit, and that's a, that's a creature known as man. Mankind needs to be reconciled. Mankind as a whole needs to be reconciled back to God. Something happened. There was a split that needs to be resolved, that needs to be addressed. There needs to be a status of peace. Mankind, is a ge in general, needs to be reconciled. The nation of Israel needs to be reconciled back to God. There was a relationship. God had a purpose for that nation. There, there, had, been a, there had been a split, a break. That relationship needs to be reconciled, brought back into a status of peace. There's a specific reconciliation that occurs within the body of Christ, there's two groups, the circumcision and the, and, and the uncircumcision. There's a reconciliation that, that has to happen with these two groups, and that's really what we're probably going to spend the bulk of the time on. And then when we, when we zoom in even closer and closer and closer and closer, you need to be reconciled. So the person that you look at in the mirror when you get up in the morning, so it starts with the universe and it goes right down to, to you individually need to be reconciled. So what we'll do is we'll... we'll tap in real quickly is this issue of the universe. Now, when we're looking at this verse in Colossians chapter 1, again, we want to we see how much Scripture uses this word peace connected with this reconciliation. God, in chapter, or, or chapter 1, verse 20, God says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. Again, yeah, that word peace is connected by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So scripture doesn't use the word universe, but it uses the terms things in earth and things in heaven, which certainly are going to include everything in the universe. That's just a different way of saying, saying all, all the things that are involved in creation itself. Now, there are two specific agencies that God is using, of course, to, to reconcile these things in earth and these things in heaven. To, to, to bring things back to a status of peace, of harmony. He's using the nation of Israel, of course, on the earth. And he's using, as we know, the body of Christ to reconcile some things in heaven. So there's, there's two specific agencies that he's using. And there is, um, as was just mentioned, a dispensational change. Now, when we're looking at this issue of the, the universe, I want to appreciate this for a second. And, and think about how many trillions of creatures have lived since the creation act when i'm talking about little microscopic things you know you have little creatures living between your eyelashes and your eyebrows you got things living in your intestines 
and on your skin. You yourself are a whole ecosystem. <laughs> now when you take that all the way back to the Creation Act, it is just a mind-blowing number of life that's existed. And yet, all of this life has something in common. It dies. God is a God of life. He's not a God, he's not a God that's interested in death. He's a God that's interested in life. So this life, this, this death issue has to be addressed. So we see, we see creatures, we see animals. Maybe you're watching late night TV and you see Sarah McLaughlin come on your TV and she tells you about the Humane Society and they show pictures of animals being tortured and things like that. And yet they don't have any sin, they, they, they were, they were, they were, but yet they're recipients. The whole, the whole creation there is just groaning. And there's, there's a pain that's related with this. So this death issue has to be addressed. Now, the, the other issue there is, and really this is where, where the heartbeat of the thing happens, is that in order for there to be peace, the prince of peace needs to have the preeminence. You're not, going to have any, you're not going to have any peace unless the Prince of Peace is in, in control over both the things in the earth and, and in the things in heaven. So both of those things have to be addressed. The death issue has to be addressed. And the issue of putting the right guy on the throne has to be addressed in order for, in order for this status of peace to occur. So when we're in Colossians, let's go back to um, verse 16. And we see here the issue that's being addressed here is this issue of authority. Who is, who is the right guy for the job? That's the, that's the issue that's being addressed here with this reconciliation. Verse 16, for by him, so let's acknowledge right out of the gate who made, this, who made this stuff to begin with. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. So again, let's acknowledge where these things are coming from to begin with. He's the head of the body, the church, who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So this issue of this, this all things being reconciled, things in earth, things in heaven, it's referring to all of the creation itself, and that he has to have the preeminence over this stuff. Again, he has, to, he has to be the one in authority. And having made peace, this authority is made possible. The peace is made possible. The cross is what accomplished it. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Now, so the issue again is that, that death itself needs to be taken care of. It was taken care of at the cross. And that's what's going to allow this reconciliation and this peace. So now, that being said, I think this is probably as good a place as any to say this publicly. I believe in universal reconciliation. <laughs> now, I, like I said, I think I should tell you that. The only problem is when I said that, some of you heard me say I believe in universal salvation. They're not the same thing. There, so what happens is people hear that word reconciliation and their brain automatically thinks about salvation. They're two different words. As we say, they're spelled differently. <laughs> reconciliation and salvation are not the same word. Reconciliation, again, has to do with this status of peace. And there will be universal reconciliation. Now, that has to do with making things balanced and making things harmonized. Now, so when we look at this passage in Colossians chapter 1, nobody's talking about everybody being saved. It's talking about the God of the universe having preeminence and, and restoring a, a situation of authority, a lack of, a lack of anger, a lack of wrath. Now, when it comes to this issue, when, when we're talking about reconciliation, it really has to be a two-way street. So let's say that there was a, a split between us, something happened, and I reconcile and say, oh, God, I want to I get back together. Let's, let's be friends. Can't we be friends? And she says, no. I want no part of it. <laughs> now I've done my part. I've, I've extended the I've extended the hand, but that's it's got to be it's got to be received. That reconciliation has to be received. So when we're talking about reconciliation in the sense of salvation, that goes out unto all 
And upon who? All them that believe. You've got to believe it. You've got you to take the information in order, in order for the information to be applied. So now when we zoom in a little bit, we're talking about this issue of, of mankind, this specific creature being reconciled. Again, anybody who is a son of Adam, there was a split that occurred. God needs to address this split and reconcile mankind as a whole and reconcile the relationship between God and man. What is man that thou art mindful of him? This little mud creature that's being, that's being reconciled. Why would this be such a major issue? Now, God's plan to reconcile mankind back to himself is unthinkable. And his plan is that he would actually become a man himself. Again, just an just a unthinkable concept. So when we're looking at those generations and we get into the book of Luke, it takes him right back to being a son of Adam through Mary's genealogy. And then ultimately Adam is a son of God. So it takes, it takes him right back in identifying himself with mankind and anybody who is a son of Adam. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this issue is, is, this, is bringing things back into a status of peace. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You have a message of peace. That's a great message. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation, the message of peace. It's the opposite of a message of wrath. Is the, is the message that God, God isn't declaring war on you. He's not declaring wrath on you. He's declaring peace. Again, what, a, what an awesome message to be able to communicate. So mankind needs to be reconciled. Now, when we zoom in a little closer, we see that there's a specific part of mankind, a specific nation, the nation of Israel, that God has is, God is created for the purpose of reconciling some things on the earth back unto himself. The only problem is that nation was in a contract relation with, relationship with Jehovah, and they failed at that. So there was a split. There was a divorce that occurred. There, was, there, there, there needs to be a reconciliation to bring this nation back into a proper status and into a status of, um, of peace. So just as, just as God did the unthinkable by becoming a man, he doesn't just become a man, but he, he becomes a specific man. He's not just a son of Adam. He's also a son of Abraham. So again, that's why the, the New Testament begins with that piece of information. So he's, he's identifying himself with humanity. He's identifying himself with the nation of Israel specifically all for the purpose of this reconciliation, all for the purpose of obtaining this peace, the status of peace. So again, there's, there's this issue of this reconciliation that occurs um, within the nation. Now, there is also a reconciliation in, that, we're, that we're talking about here, the book of Ephesians talks about, is there's a reconciliation that's occurring within the body. So within the body of Christ, the body as a whole is being reconciled to God, but there's a reconciliation that's occurring within the body. There's two groups within this body, and these two groups are the circumcision and the uncircumcision, Jew and Gentile. So there's a, there's a reconciliation that occurs within this group. Now, what happens is we want to understand that there's an animosity, an enmity between these two groups. They got a history. They don't like each other. They have problems. Again, there, 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 are some, there are some issues that have occurred that, that, that have got to be addressed. So we live in a country, and we're, it's certainly not a unique country in this. There's, 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 there's differences between groups all over the globe, but certainly we have them. They're recognizable here. Racial issues. There are times in, in this country where it wasn't too long ago where one group, when they got onto a bus would have to sit in a certain section of the bus 
and another group would sit on a different section of the bus. You got to go to a different bathroom. You use a different drinking fountain. There's a, there's a, there's a distinction between those groups. There's a, there's a um, again, there's, there's a tension. There's, a, there's an enmity. Maybe, maybe somebody who doesn't like the idea of you marrying somebody from that other group. Maybe you would have the audacity to go to a lunch counter and sit with somebody from that other group. And then when your group comes, you get up because you don't want to deal with the wrath. You don't want to be seen eating with those, those other individuals. So again, this is something that we're, we're familiar with and we're aware of these things. Now, what happens is there's a division that occurs within humanity. God, by the way, is actually the one that creates the division. And he, and, he, and he sets up two groups, and he's got these groups, the circumcision, and he separates them from the uncircumcision and says, listen, you are not supposed to eat with them. You're not supposed to marry them. I want you separate. I don't want you hanging out with them. I don't want you socializing with them. I want you to be unique, and I want you to be peculiar, and I want you to be separated from these groups. Now... For time's sake, I'm going to just, we don't, we don't need to go through all these verses because we're familiar with this, but this, this begins again very early on. So when we're, when we're in books like Genesis, God, God takes that nation and says, I've separated you. Anybody, who, anybody who's not part of this circumcision is now cut off. I'm the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. That's Leviticus chapter 20. And then when we get all the way up into the Gospels and, and Christ comes into contact with somebody from this other side of the tracks and, and she dares talk to him about some issues, he, he, he refers to her as a dog. He's acknowledging that she's, she's from a different group than the group that he's part of. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a tension or a history that occurs. Now, again, there's, there's in, in time past, what we want to understand is that God, the God of the universe, had no love lost for the uncircumcision. God, God had, had feelings towards this group, the uncircumcision, and they were not pleasant feelings. They're not delightful feelings. There's a, there's a tension between God and the uncircumcision. Now, there's, just, to, just to give you an idea here, is in Ezekiel, we read, Thus saith the Lord God, No stranger uncircumcised in heart nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. You don't dare bring a Gentile into my temple. Now, archaeologists have actually found that in, in the ruins of the temple. they got a stone there. And it says it in no uncertain terms. No Gentile may enter beyond the dividing wall into the court around the holy place. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his subsequent death. There it is, black and white. You dare bring a Gentile in, you're going to die, and you got no one but yourself to blame for the issue. There, there's an animosity and an enmity between these, these two groups. Now let's go up to Galatians, Galatians chapter 2, and we just want to see how, 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 how real this is. Galatians chapter 2, and again, we're talking about um, these issues of these two groups being separated. Galatians chapter 2, Galatians. Galatians chapter 2, verse 12. For before that, certain came from James. He did eat with the Gentiles. <laughs> he had the nerve to go up to that counter and, and sit down with the group that he wasn't supposed to be sitting down with. And when he knew that his people were, people were coming, he, he, he realized that he had to get out of there. He did eat with the Gentiles, but then, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. That there's going to be an accountability that goes on. Let's go back to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. 
and we want to we want to see what's going on between these these different groups. Acts chapter ten, and we're familiar with this incident. But but what happens here is that God is talking to Peter, and and he and he's getting ready to send him out to a Gentile, and Peter's reaction right out of the gate is no. No, that, that, would, that would be against the law for me to do that. I can't sit in the same section of the bus as these guys. I can't go into the same restroom or drink from the same fountain. We're separated. We're, we're, we're supposed to be separated. Acts chapter 10, again, we see this vision. Verse 13, there came a voice unto him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's answer is this. Peter said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Look over at verse 28. And again, he's going to Cornelius here. Verse 28, and he said unto them, you know how that it's an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. The laws are changing. Things are things are different now, and there is there there are some issues that are being addressed now. When we're looking at some of these issues and how serious this is, these divisions that are being made again that that there there are laws in effect, and when we're when we're looking at the differences there, let's go let's go back to Ephesians chapter two, Ephesians chapter two. God is addressing in Ephesians chapter 2 is, again, that the laws are changing. There, 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 are some, there are some things here. There are some status things that are changing. But as he's beginning this little passage, he's, he's, he's bringing us into mind and, and into remembrance of, hey, you used to sit at a different section. You, you used different restrooms. You, you were using different fountains. Let's not, let's not forget that. that there's, there, there's, there's a difference that occurred. Ephesians chapter 2, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. They got, they got five strikes against them that at that time ye were without Christ. That's not good. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. That's not good. Strangers from the covenants of promise. That's bad. Having no hope. That's really bad. Without God in the world. That's really bad. And yet there's another group over on the other side. They have a different status. They're children of promise. They're nigh to God. They're near to God. They have the oracles of God. They worship the living God. They have a, they have a, they have a status... Of, they go to different schools. They have, they have status of privilege. And again, what we want to understand is God is the one that built that wall. God is the one that didn't want you and me coming over to that side of the fence. He's the one that put up the wall to keep you and I out. And again, we want to, and, and we're, bringing, we're being brought into remembrance of this. You were the group that was trying to, that, that was being, Kept away. You were the group that was being separated here. So a Jew would have natural enmity toward a Gentile, hostility, hatred. Again, they had a history there. And so what God does is as he's creating the church, the body of Christ, he does something that's really spectacular in the sense of this. He's, he's revealing some things about who he is and what he values and what he esteems. And what he esteems is forgiveness, mercy, compassion. Breaking, breaking, down, breaking down these walls of separation. He, he esteems bearing the hatchet, taking the hatchet and getting, getting, putting it in the way, not, not bringing it back out. Let's get, let's get, let's get this thing out of, out of the way. Let's get this thing separated. So what he does is he takes... A twice-dead Gentile, 
Let's hold, let's hold our place in Ephesians there and let's go to Colossians real quick and just take a peek at this. Colossians chapter 2. He takes a, a, a Gentile that has been good and separated. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. So let's get it straight, who, who you were to begin with. Number one, you're dead in your sins. Number two, you were coming from the wrong side of the tracks to begin with. And yet, and yet he's done... Some things have hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. So what he's doing here is there's a racial or an ethnic merger, if you could say it like that. They're all on the same bus, but this time they don't have to sit in separate sections. They're all, they're all, they're all placed in the same body, but there's not a separation. They're all, they're all being brought together and made one. And, and there's, there's an image there that a Jew is being reconciled together with a Gentile. So again, this, this passage is referring to this, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. Again, you got, we want to connect that word peace with reconciliation. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man. So making, there it is again, peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached, there it is again, peace to you which were far off and to them that are not, were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. Things have changed. There, there, there have been some laws that are, that are new laws. There are some new things on the books. You're, you, you were this. You are no longer this anymore. Now, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners. But fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now, what, what happens is this, is, is this Gentile salvation at the end of the day is, is really never, it's not a mystery. That's not the mystery, is that Gentiles could be saved or could be brought in. What happens is this, there, there's a, what, what, what's a part of this mystery is that a, a, a dirty Gentile dog who had been separated might now not only be brought in, but might actually be put in a position that they might actually reign and govern. Now, that's really mind-blowing. That's, that's an unthinkable thing. So when you take Saul of Tarsus, a Pharisee, and you tell him that a Gentile might be put in a position to reign in the heavens, you see what an offense of that message that would have been to him? That he, was, that he was going out and, 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 and being, it, being the, the messenger of it's an unthinkable thing. So again, we're not going to, for time's sake, go to these passages, but Romans chapter 8 talks about a Gentile being heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about a Gentile being raised up together, seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Unthinkable. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 talks about a Gentile judging angels. Unthinkable, unthinkable information. So the mystery includes this information that an uncircumcised Gentile could not only be saved from wrath, but could actually share in the opportunity to reign. And Paul is the one that is revealing this information. Now, it wasn't long ago that this man would have had to sit in a different section on a bus. Would have had to drink from a different fountain. Would have had to go to a different school. And now he has the audacity to reign over others. To govern. Unthinkable. God bless America. <laughs> Only in America could something like that happen, right? Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Now, we're not talking about policies or anything like that. What we're talking about now, now there is actually some individuals that they would be 
offended. They're not offended by his policies. They're offended by the fact that maybe a dark-skinned man might govern over them. And yet that's exactly what God is doing with you. He's taking somebody that you wouldn't even imagine governing and putting you in a position of authority. So again, we want to watch how, how, we, how we esteem these things, but that's exactly what, what God is also doing with us. Now, it's not, it's not surprising. You know, we're not defending any policies or we're not getting political or anything like that, but the idea is that there would be some individuals that their sole mission in life is to disqualify this individual. They have such hatred for somebody govern, governing over them that they're going to try to find reasons. Show me the birth certificate. Disqualify this man to govern over us. You can imagine how the satanic policy of evil feels about you, a nasty, dirty, idol-worshipping Gentile reigning in the heavens. You can imagine how he wants to disqualify you. Any, any, any reason, any excuse to say, not, not them, not you. And again, the, the exact same... Thing is happening there. Now, when we zoom in a little bit and, and, and we really zoom into this issue of reconciliation, who needs to be reconciled is you. That person, when you get up, that you look at the mirror every day. So you, you start with the universe and you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. And then it goes right to you. It goes to your house where you live. You were cut off. You were separated. You were alienated. God needs to extend that arm of reconciliation to you. A status of peace. Instead of a status of wrath, saying, I'm, I'm reconciling with you. Now, you don't have to accept that reconciliation. We go out and we, we preach that gospel of the grace of God. You know, God's not mad at you. God's declared peace with you. Christ, Christ took on the wrath. Just trust it by faith. God, God will give you the salvation. I'm not having it. The reconciliation was there. That's, that's up to the individual to either accept that reconciliation or to not accept that reconciliation. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. So just as he's identified himself with mankind... And he's identified himself specifically with the nation of Israel. He identified himself with you. Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled the cross is the key that allows the reconciliation to happen so when we when we see that word reconciliation or being reconciled in the old testament you're always going to see very close to that word blood so they bring those sacrifices and, and the purpose of the blood is for reconciliation the blood is purchasing peace is what it's doing so it's, it, the word reconciliation is always connected with blood in the Old Testament. When we get into the New Testament, we see that word reconciliation as we're seeing. It's connected with peace. But, it's, but it's, it's, the, it's the death, it's the blood that purchases the reconciliation. It's not his teaching. It's not his life. It's not his birth. It's not his resurrection. It is his death that purchases the reconciliation. It's the blood that purchases the reconciliation. The cross is, is the key that allows that thing, that, that allows that reconciliation to happen in the first place. Let's go back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Again, when, when we're reading about this reconciliation... We want to we want to not miss the fact that the blood is what has purchased the reconciliation. The cross is what's purchased it. 
verse 14, for he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, and here it is, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. It's the blood, it's the death, it's the cross that purchases the reconciliation to begin with. That word atonement is very connected with the word reconciliation. They're very, again, connected words. Now, again, in in, um, conclusion to this, there are several things that need to be reconciled in the Bible, and we could go, and there are, there are actually others, but there, there are some, some issues that we want to understand when we're talking about reconciliation, that there are different aspects of it. Number one, the entire creation needs to be reconciled. It was out of balance. It needs to be put back into balance. The Prince of Peace needs to be reigning on the throne in order for those things to be happening. Again, he's, he's, he's reconciling these things over his creation. Mankind in general needs to be reconciled. Reconciled. Man as, man as a whole needs to be reconciled. The nation of Israel needs to be reconciled. And they will be. There's a reconciliation that occurs at the second coming where they're going to be put back into a profitable relationship with Jehovah. There's a reconciliation that occurs within the body of Christ. Reconciliation between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. So again, we don't want to miss that. Both both are being reconciled to God, but you're taking two groups that were not together and putting them together for the function of, of doing some things together, working together on some things. And there's that's some phenomenal, wonderful information. And then you individually were reconciled. That's priceless. So you, you, as, you as an individual were, were reconciled. Now, again, the idea is that reconciliation, it's not just the issue of burying the hatchet. The reconciliation at the end of the day is to create peace. That's the purpose of the, that's the, purpose of the reconciliation. Some things were apart. Now they're back together. There is a status of peace, the mind of Christ in action. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll close out with this. You might have somebody in your life that you need to reconcile with, that you have enmity against. Maybe there's an anger. Maybe there's a bitterness. Maybe there's a hostility between the two. Maybe there's, maybe there's a wall that's been put up between the two. Maybe it's, maybe it's a sibling. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a, um, a parent. Whoever it is, there, there, there's somebody that maybe you need to reconcile with. Maybe there's a hostility. Maybe there's a hatred. Maybe you have a history between the two of you. Maybe they wronged you. That's the the idea, that reconciliation that occurs. Now, what we don't want to miss, and I'll just just read this verse because we're familiar with this, but maybe they have not even bothered to ask for your forgiveness. How dare them. And yet when we read about this reconciliation, we read, for if when we were enemies, not extending an arm, not, not extending the, the desire to get back together, the reconciliation occurred when we were enemies. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God wants you to reconcile with that individual. God wants you to extend an arm of peace. Now, they might not receive it, but you, but you extend that arm. It, it, it's up to them to, the, to receive the reconciliation, but it's up to you to extend that to begin with. Now, um, this is a great school, the Bible conference, so we'll say this, um, is if you are in the school, my encouragement is that you continue with the school and that you, you, you keep on keeping on. It's not always easy, but if, if, you're, if you have those around you, whether it's, a, again, a family member or another saint, somebody in your church, um, to encourage one another to keep, keep plugging on and um, to continue with, with the school. And um, we do want to, again, just really acknowledge the, the ministry of the school. Um, 
show of hands real quickly, who would you say in this room um, has grade school the Bible made a difference in your life? Show of hands. Okay. So there's a, there's a few. Okay. So just to acknowledge that again, if you're in the school, um, to, en to encourage one another and... Um, we just want to, again, real quickly thank all the other speakers and just there just really have been some wonderful messages um, today and we're looking forward to the other ones. Lord God, we thank you for the morning. Um, we thank you for the cross. And we thank you for the book that you've preserved and given to us to study these things out and to learn more about um, the attrib attributes that you have of love and forgiveness. And it's in the wonderful name of your son that we pray these things. Amen. Amen.